The following program oh, is I part of a Lower Kuskokwim School District bilingual instructional so television project. The you original program was produced in the Yupik language. <laughs> Today, dog teams race. The care and feeding of the race teams has become more and more technical as mushers and handlers look for a combination of nutrients that produce dogs that have speed and endurance. For many of the dog mushers, the primary purpose for having a team is recreation. In the past, dog teams were not a luxury, but a necessity. Akiak residents, Lot Iguak and Alfred Lake, reminisced about dog mushing. Mr. Iguak tells us about differences between racing and working dogs. The race dogs of today could not keep up with dogs we used to have. They are weak and they cannot carry any load. Even if our dogs had a heavy load, they would keep up their pace. Those dogs like to go during the night. In the evening, after they had been on the move all day, they wanted to keep right on going. The dogs used in the 50s and before were fed a diet that contained few commercial products. Mr. Iguak tells us what he fed his dogs. I fed the dogs anything, frozen lush, frozen whitefish, and dried king salmon. I included the salmon roe when making dog food, anything, blackfish even. We used to hunt food for the dogs and got plenty of it so we would not run out until summer. Like I said, that was a different kind of food for the dogs. The family would also eat the food that was gathered. The storage space that we had was large. We would fill it full and then climb on top of the fish and press the mass down. Then we would put more on top. We would catch a lot of king salmon, dry them and store them. We would get white fish, lush and blackfish in the fall after the river was frozen. Also, we would get white fish in the fall before freeze up and put them in pits to age. The pits were for dog food. After freeze up, we would pull the white fish from the pit and feed them to the dogs. <laughs> Uh, white fish, manikinat, imangat, uksokamit peak siuki, uksokan chikokan, sama kun toi pitu. Uksokamit su, imkut white fish at unak siuki chiku wailin tukkaluki siu. Tukkaluki toi temuk nenak kiyakulu. Toi simung ning ligan chikon. I'm 
After cutting the fish in small pieces, we cooked it. When it was done, we added some fish roe to make the broth better. And after that, we mixed some flour in a small pan, then added it to the broth, stirring it constantly. Then we removed the wood from the fire and cooled it off. When it was done, it was good, not too thick and not too thin. That is why the dogs were never skinny. Sometimes we would make some soup for them. Sometimes if we gave them fish only, we would give them water to drink. When they had high protein food, the dogs were strong. They could pull a 14-foot sled that was fully loaded. The dogs were used for everything. We used them to get wood, we used them to go to spring camp and to the mountains. When we went hunting in November, our dogs and those of our elders never stopped. They were used all winter until the ice was not safe to travel on or until the snow was gone. The dogs we had were not like the dogs of today. They were strong. The sled we had was about 14 feet long. When we were getting ready to go, we loaded them fully front to back. The sled was loaded as high as a man's head. Just the head and shoulders would be showing. But those dogs would pull us. We didn't have many dogs, somewhere between 9 and 12. We went over to Nushigak and to the Tikchik area with our sled fully loaded. We used to travel all day without stopping. We stopped only at night. The next day, we would travel again all day until nightfall. Our dogs would never get run down. They would pick up speed in the afternoon. When the sled was loaded that fully, it was not too heavy for them. We couldn't lift the sled or move it, but the sled was not too heavy for the dogs. We would travel over the mountains. We went over two or three mountain ranges with that much load, and yet we moved fast. The dogs never tired. They were strong. Even if they traveled all day, they never got tired. During the night, they still wanted to travel, but we would stop them. That is when we traveled without any load in the mountains to our trapping line. We traveled all day. When we didn't have a smooth trail, we traveled over the mountains to other rivers. There were no bad dogs in those days. Some dogs were too fast. When they traveled or when they went to Bethel, they would break up the 10 foot long sleds they would break one side of the runner, collapsing it from front to the back. They would arrive here with just one runner. The dogs that were too strong and too fast did that. <laughs> Enough.
The dogs were necessary to allow hunters to travel from one area to another to catch the game necessary for survival. When we traveled from here, Akiak, we used to travel for two weeks to Bristol Bay. A group of hunters went together from here and then they would separate. A person might go to the Aniak River, another to the Holitna, the Tikchiks, or the Nushigak area, or to the other side of the Kilbuk Lakes, to the place called Chikunuk. <laughs> <coughs> there is no dog nowadays to match those dogs. Today's dogs are not as strong or as large as the dogs of yesterday. Some of those dogs were very large. That is why they were strong. Like I said, they were used for different things, for wood, for camping, for hunting, trapping, and also for subsistence. We used them all winter until there were no trails in the spring. Those dogs we used have no match. Even when the trail was deep with snow, the dogs would keep going. The snow was deep, but still they pulled the sled. When we went camping, we did not hunt for beavers only. We also used to hunt squirrels. When the whole family went, we would be freighting. Freight for half a day and return, then make another trip. When we did that, I think it took us one month to get to the Tik Chik Lake area. And when we got there, we would go in different places, separating from Tik Chik Lake. We call the Tik Chik Lake area 
large Yahweh. We separated from there to Hulitna, Nushagak, and Jikunuk area to hunt for parka squirrels. We would set up a date to return to Chiklik Lake. From there, we would travel together toward Kizaralik. When we reached the head of Kizaralik, to two lakes, we would make skin boats. We would make a boat large enough to carry our belongings, grub, dogs, and the whole family in one boat. It took about ten skins. The whole family used to go, bringing their wives and children along. The equipment used nowadays is for the most part purchased by the dog mushers. Mr. Lake describes sleds and harnesses that were made by the earlier dog drivers. Those freight sleds were made from spruce wood by using an adze. The men would adze it to form the front. They never used nails or bolts, but used caribou, moose, or reindeer hide bindings. After soaking and removing the hair, they used to bind the sled with that hide. They also used seal skin for binding. They never used bolts or nails, only binding. That is the type of sled people used for heavy load. When they started making small sleds of birch, they would split the birch. I used to see the reindeer herder sled about so wide. I used those when I was about six years old to go mushing with three dogs. Harnesses had a cross on top and one strip on top to keep them from sliding down. They used that type of harness most of the time. When they did not have webbing, they used gunny sack. They rolled the sack up with a piece of cloth inside and sewed it closed. They made harnesses out of the materials available to them. They made large harnesses with a piece of wood at the back end. They called those real harnesses. They would form two X's on the back. They used felt for padding on the harnesses. They made thick padding with the felt. For gang lines, some had cow hides, some had moose hides, and others had manila rope.
In the villages, the use of dogs began to diminish when the snow machine appeared. The first snowgoes were called snow travelers. The stores first began selling them in the early 1960s. They were not very reliable and traveled at a slow pace. A person on a dog team could go much faster. The snow goes seemed pretty strong, but at first the village people did not trust them. Mr. Lake and Mr. Igwak do not travel anymore, but if they did, they would choose to go by dog team. They feel that part of the problem with young people is that they don't travel to winter camp anymore. They use snow machines to go back and forth from village to village. Mr. We asked Mr. Lake for advice on how to raise dogs. The old people used to tell us if we want to have good dogs to watch them closely and when they get about six weeks old tie them to prevent them from eating scraps of food or make a fence for them about four feet by four feet so they would not run around. We should do that if we want to have good dogs. Dogs that eat stuff from the ground might eat something that will make them sick. But if they are kept from running around and their area is kept clean, the dogs will be good when they are grown. Talk to the dogs like people. They learn to understand. They will listen to what you say. When you are traveling with them, never beat them up. If you never beat them, even if they leave you behind, when you call for them, they will return to you. If they are running fast, call out G or Ha. If your voice can reach them, if your leader is good, they will return. I started training my dogs when they were about six months old, but I never used them for distance. I let them pull about one or two miles and then took them off. When they grew up, when I wanted to have good dogs, I used to run them as fast as they could go. When they slowed down, I stopped, even if it was during the day. Then I would take them out again the next day. When I make lead dogs, I never showed too much affection. But sometimes I took a stick to them and did not treat them too kindly. You can't really train a dog by mistreating or over-loving the dog. You have to treat, treat it kind of in between. <laughs> Look 
In the 60s, when snow machines arrived in the villages, life changed for the village dog. Basically, a work animal used for traveling to hunting grounds, the dog worked less and less. People used snow machines for travel around the villages. Distances traveled for hunting became shorter. With the current interest in dog racing, the care and feeding of dogs has become a topic of interest. Dogs have once again become an integral part of life for some people in rural Alaska. I fed the dogs anything, frozen lush, frozen whitefish and dried king salmon. I included the salmon roe when making dog food anything, blackfish even. We used to hunt food for the dogs and got plenty of it so we would not run out until summer. Like I said, that was a different kind of food for the dogs. The following program is part of a Lower Kuskokwim School District bilingual instructional television project. The original program was produced in the Yupik language. Today, dog teams race. They had been on the move all day. They wanted to keep right on going. The dogs used in the 50s and before were fed a diet that contained few commercial products. Mr. Iguak tells us what he fed his dogs. Chatan 
The race dogs of today could not keep up with dogs we used to have. They are weak and they cannot carry any load. Even if our dogs had a heavy load, they would keep up their pace. Those dogs like to go during the night. In the evening, after the, the care and feeding of the race teams has become more and more technical as mushers and handlers look for a combination of nutrients that produce dogs that have speed and endurance. For many of the dog mushers, the primary purpose for having a team is recreation. In the past, dog teams were not a luxury, but a necessity. Akiak residents, Lot Iguak and Alfred Lake, reminisced about dog mushing. Mr. Iguak tells us about differences between racing and working dogs. Mr. Iguak, I'm a kalahut ka hayuk. 